hey, thanks for joining us today. And uh, I'm honored to have with me uh, Secretary Racine, Commissioner Yacoboni, Hal Cohen, me and Mark, you did, Mark, you did such a great job at COTS. And who else do I have? Barbara from the network. Barbara from the network. Thank you. Mr. Hartman, Jan Thank you. Welcome. Uh, in the last uh, several months, Vermont has had three homeless people perish in the cold. As you know, I've been committed to ending homelessness in Vermont throughout my career in public service. It's a tragedy that any state would allow people to freeze to death outside. So I've asked Secretary Racine and my team, Commissioner Iacovoni and the networks, to work together with me to ensure that we do everything within our power to avoid having Vermonters freeze to death outside. I'm going to be signing an executive order shortly that reestablishes the Vermont Council on Homelessness to implement a homeless plan to end homelessness in Vermont. Our goal is simple. Move homeless people from shelters and motels to permanent housing. I am appointing Angus Cheney as director of housing at, a, at, a, at the Agency of Human Services to lead this effort. And I want to thank Secretary Racine for his leadership in making that happen. We'll hear from Angus shortly. Third, I've asked Secretary Racine to waive eligibility requirements for shelters during harsh and dangerously cold weather so that every homeless person knows that when it's cold, they have a place to go at night. The state's launched the rental subsidy program that's going to allow low-income Vermonters to pay their rent. It includes case management support to keep people from becoming homeless. And we are authorizing 100 housing vouchers to help move people from shelters and motels to permanent housing to homeless Vermonters and those who are suffering from mental illness. I'm going to sign this executive order now, and then I want to ask uh, Angus to say a few words about his vision in implementing this plan as we reauthorize uh, the establishment of the Vermont Council on Homelessness. Then I'm going to ask Rita to say a few words about her challenge. We have a rising number of homeless people in Vermont. I, don't, I know that Vermont is one of the most compassionate states in the country, where we care deeply about every Vermonter, understands that it's unacceptable to have Vermonters dying in the streets because of cold weather. I believe these actions will give us a better chance in our effort to end homelessness in Vermont and to ensure that no Vermonter freezes in the streets. So Angus, I'm going to turn it over to you, and then we'll hear from you. Congratulations. Thank you. Board. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, members of the press. I won't take a lot of your time. I, I am too new um, to get way out on a limb with this, but I just want to share a little bit. Um, I've been working on the issues of uh, homelessness and homelessness prevention for about 10 or 11 years now, um, both at the provider level, uh, working with uh, community action agencies, um, and really uh, came to understand the link between poverty and homelessness. For the last seven or eight years, I've been with the Office of Economic Opportunity, um, continuing that work with our fantastic shelter for, uh, partners and our, uh, and our nonprofit agencies that are pr providing all the good prevention work. There's been a, a, a growing um, acknowledgement within our Agency of Human Services that housing is, is key and is critical to the success of any of the um, services that we would provide. There's been some great momentum. Um, I want to thank the governor for his work at putting together the summit on, on housing the homeless that happened back in May. And I think we periodically need to re-energize our efforts. We need um, something like that to get uh, folks from all over the state to come together and, um, and figure out where are the missing pieces, where are the gaps. How do we align our policies better? How do we make sure we're all pulling in the same direction? The goal is fairly simple. It's ending homelessness. 
the solution is not rocket science, it's affordable permanent housing. You're going to see some exciting changes, I think, in the next year in terms of the way we view this issue. It cannot be viewed through the lens of a single grant, a single program, or a single division of government. Um, part of the role for reestablishing the interagency, or the, excuse me, the, the Vermont Council on Homelessness is to get everybody in the same room and make sure that, that, we, are, that we are in alignment in terms of our policies. Um, so I just once again, I just really want to um, let everyone know that I'm really excited about this opportunity to take the work I've been doing at the provider level and with the OEO to the agency level. And I want to commend our administration for recognizing the urgency of this issue. It's hard when, when an issue has been a crisis for 30 years. It would be easy to um, let ourselves slide a little bit on it and, and start to accept any sort of uh, level of homelessness in Vermont. I will encourage you all not to accept that. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lucas. And uh, I now want to introduce Rita, Rita Markley, who's the Executive Director of COTS, a great example of an organization supported mostly by donations from generous Vermonters who ensures that we do everything that we can for homeless Vermonters. I had the pleasure on Martin Luther King Day of uh, cooking uh, food at, at one of, the, of COTS facilities uh, on Main Street in Burlington. Uh, that allows uh, Vermonters to get temporary housing before we move them to permanent housing. A lot of moms and dads with children there looking forward to permanent housing as quickly as we can move them. So, Rita, thank you and Cost for all your great work. And why don't you come on up? Thank you. I have an eight page speech here, but really I'll read quickly. <laughs> no, kidding. I am. Um... Don't pull an Obama on us. I'm not going to pull an Obama. <laughs> I want to commend this administration for presenting. I hope you take the time to read through the release, because this is a really comprehensive plan. And during a very difficult economy, it's so easy to just focus on the crisis and to do a short-term fix. And what's unique about today and this order is that we are setting out, the governor, this administration, is setting out to do two things. To ensure, with changes in the guidelines for emergency assistance, that no Vermonter on the coldest nights who has no options is left without a place to turn. These new flexible guidelines are going to mean that people, when, when shelters are full or there isn't room, that they'll get emergency assistance perhaps through an overflow motel, people who might not otherwise have been eligible. But even more, we're not doing this as a trade for the long-term solution, which is breaking the fall before people become homeless in the first place. And what I am most grateful for is that in this plan, not only do we have subsidies, state-funded subsidies to help keep people in their homes during difficult times when their job changes or their family income plummets or something happens. We will keep them in homes, but we also have a unified position at AHS that's going to navigate many of the cumbersome systems currently in place to create a coherent homeless prevention strategy. And just to give you an idea of how important this is, my organization, COTS, for the past four years, has run a homeless prevention and rehousing program. And in the past four years, at about a cost of $800 per household, we have kept from eviction and foreclosure 816 homeless families who otherwise would be sleeping in their cars, in shelters, or doubled up in places that aren't good for kids or families. So, I am very grateful. You know, H.L. Mencken once said that faith is the illogical belief in the improbable. And one of my favorite things about this administration, the talent on the AHS team, is that we believe in doing what most other states have given up on long ago. So we're going to do prevention, and we're going to make sure that everyone has a place to turn on the coldest nights. And one last thing. I had tried to persuade one of the moms in our shelter to come and share a little bit of her story. But when we talk about numbers and policies, it doesn't convey to you what it's really like 
for the people who don't have a home. So I'm going to just read you three quotes so you understand at the level of your hearts why this matters. The first is from a woman who's a 34-year-old teacher's aide on what it's like to suddenly find yourself homeless. I'll tell you what it's like. It's like treading water, and the water is so cold, and your muscles ache, but you can't stop. And every time you think you're getting somewhere, the current changes, or the waves just get rougher. That's from her. And here's from her nine-year-old son. Well, the hardest part is right before I open my eyes in the morning. Because when I sleep, my dreams go back to my old room. And then I think I'm still there. But then doors start slamming, and the water is running. And I remember, we're still not home. Well, today, signing this takes us a lot closer so that kids like him are on their way to home and opportunities. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Rita. Thanks for your great work. <coughs> Secretary, what you want to add? Are you? No? Fire away. Thanks for the great network and support. We appreciate it. If you have questions, uh, we'd be happy to answer them. Do you want to uh, appeal the answer to the I thought we were talking about home. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, as I've said, obviously the decision from Judge Murtha's disappointment. We're exploring all of our options right now, and we'll make a decision on the appeal uh, within the time period allowed by the courts. But we haven't made a decision. And until we do, I'll be uncharacteristic uncharacteristically quiet. <laughs> Does, is the cost of litigating a factor for you? You know, it's not the first thing one considers. But obviously, as a business person, I always look at cost. But that isn't the first consideration. The first consideration is how do you take a disappointing decision that doesn't make a lot of sense and ensure that you proceed in a way that meets the objectives of the state of Vermont. You still have full confidence in your attorney general in his office, uh, despite you know, I think this is absolutely an inappropriate time to question our Attorney General. They're working very hard there, and uh, I don't believe that we should be second-guessing them. Do you have full confidence in, in his abilities now? As I just said, I really don't believe it's helpful to be second-guessing the Attorney General. They argued forcefully in the state of Vermont. But do you think he... Has, has argued sufficiently on behalf of the state of Yes, I do. In, in, in cases where uh, you're dealing with preemption and you're up against uh, law firms that come from you know, Washington, D.C. or wherever, with very, very, very skilled lawyers, do you think that uh, maybe we should get outside counsel who um, could perhaps assist the state in a way beyond the assistant AGs? Can do. Um, you know, do, you, do you think we should have, have experts retained to help the state in these matters? Well, I think it's important to know that the Attorney General did consult with experts outside of the Attorney General's office in the case that we just argued and is certainly open to continuing to do that going forward. So that's again a decision that we'll be making in the coming weeks. Is the decision to appeal his or will it be a um, uh, 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 team? Effort. This that will involve you. It is the Attorney General's uh, purview to decide whether or not to appeal this case. He's been kind enough to consult with me, but it is the Attorney General's jurisdiction. Do you have a, a, a have you in your mind uh, an idea of what you'd like to see done that you're just not sharing, or don't you know? I'm really not going to comment on the appeal until we've made the decisions that we need to make going forward. But aren't you the client in the case? I mean, wouldn't you, it's not just his purview, right? I mean, you, you, you're the first name listed in the complaint um, in your official, official capacity, of course. But as the client, don't you get to say whether or not he should appeal? You know, I have a very good relationship with the Attorney General, and I'm 
appreciative of the fact that uh, he's consulted me at every turn in this case, and I don't expect that to change going forward. Um, <laughs> Same for years. <coughs> we shut this plant down in 2012. Um, is that still going to happen in your estimation? Can you still make that, be confident that that's going to happen when you talk about Yankee? You know, it has been no secret that I feel very strongly that it's in the best interest of Vermont to close the plan on schedule in 2012. And my view on Vermont Yankee hasn't changed. It's been clear and articulated many, many times. What we're focusing on now is how we uh, get the best decision that we can. As you know, there are two pieces here. One is the appeal, and the other is being heard before the Public Service Board. Let's not forget that Judge Murtha's decision affirms Vermont's ability to have destiny over their own future by going before the Public Service Board. I have a lot of confidence in the Public Service Board, and uh, we'll go forward from here in is determining you, what makes your expectation sense. that the PSP will try to convince the, uh, that the, that the Department of Safety will try to convince the PSP that it's the right thing to close down here? You know, the Department of Public Service, is that who you're asking about? Yeah. Yeah. The Department of Public Service, as you know, is independent of me. Uh, they'll be making their own decisions. What I can tell you uh, is that uh, they have, the Public Service Department is requesting a status conference with the Public Service Board as soon as the appeal decision has been made and the appeal time has transpired. How much so more is, is the state willing to spend? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, obviously, we're going to spend what, whatever we need to spend to ensure that Vermonters get a good decision. I want to make clear that on the question of spending, I've read a lot about what this case has cost. I'm surprised that no one in the press has asked whether that's been a net gain or a loss to taxpayers. It's important to know that this year alone, the Attorney General has brought in about $40 million into the Attorney General's office from winning cases. And that's a lot more than we've spent on legal counsel in any cases. So when we have this conversation about cost, it's very important to know that the Attorney General's office seems to do a great job of winning cases and bringing in more revenue for taxpayers than they pay out. So just so I understand the procedure, you're saying that after the 30 days appeal decision time has expired, <coughs> a month from last Thursday, the department is going to ask for a status conference in the case? They've actually filed as of, we'll be filing later today, a request for a status conference with the Public Service Board as soon as the 30-day period has expired. Okay. Yep. Is it your understanding that, it, that the board can proceed with that case while an appeal is pending? That's a determination that the Public Service Board and the Attorney General's Office right now is trying to determine. In other words, the question of should parts or all of the case be appealed to the Second Circuit, the question of whether or not the Public Service Board would act simultaneously is unresolved, and that's something the Attorney General is trying to ferret through right now. You were uh, <clears throat> quite involved in uh, some of the legislative action when you were in the Senate on this. Um, and obviously, there was, there was a significant amount of second guessing from the judge last week about the use of the word safety, for instance. Do you have any regrets about the way uh, the legislature handled this and the way you led the legislature in handling this? Again, Dave, as much as I want to answer that question, I'm not going to. Do you have more faith in the Public Service Board now than you did, say, two or three years ago? I've always had faith in the Public Service Board. I think the system works for Vermont. But a lot of the effort was to keep this out of the Public Service Board. Well, can we just back up there in history for a minute? I was not in public service when Act 60 was passed. just want to remind you, it was the legislature at the time and the governor at the time, Governor Douglas, who signed Act 160. When I took over as president of the Senate, the law said that in order for Vermont Yankee 
to run past its design life, it was required that the legislature vote affirmatively that it was in the best interest of Vermonters or the Public Service Board could not issue a certificate of public good. All I did as Senate President is follow the law. I didn't write the law, I didn't vote on the law, I inherited the law. But given what the, the ruling uh, goes into great detail uh, in examining the legislative record, do you think that, when we talk about Sorrell, but he had a certain set of facts to defend and the judge picked up on that. Did, do you think that the Attorney General uh, had a bad set of facts to defend here, given the legislative record? Again, I'm not going to comment on the case until the appeal decision has been made, and then I would love to discuss this further with you. Governor, can you describe the process of how the Public Service Board will review the case to determine whether or not they will issue a certificate of public good? What issues will they address? And because of how the Public Service Board operates in a procedural manner, what happens if they are not able to render a decision on a um, certificate of public good by March 21st, uh, when the current certificate of public good expires. Can Vermont Yankee actually operate without a new certificate of public good in place past March 31st? I mean, 21st. It's clear from judges, Judge Murtha's decision that yes, they can continue to operate after March 21st. In terms of how the board will proceed and what questions they'll be looking at, you really have to address those questions to the public service board. You said you didn't write the law, but you chose to use it as a way to prevent the issue from coming before the Public Service Board, which would, on its face, seem to reflect some. Well, I just want to back up there, Peter, because that actually has never been asked of me. But when I was president of the Senate, and uh, Speaker Smith was Speaker of the House, uh, I was approached by the chair of the Public Service Board at the time, who happens to be the chair that I reappointed, who said to us, you either need to pass a law that clarifies that we can take up this case without legislative approval, or we cannot take up the case. So I felt compelled, based upon that conversation with the chair, to let the public serve, to comply with the law. And I think we made the right decision. But you voted not to send this issue to the PS3 in that vote, which which would seem to reflect some lack of confidence in the in the no. pro process. That no, we, it's so not. A, it was. It's not, it had nothing to do with the process. Yeah. But why why did you not want the case to go to the PSB then? You sound confident about that process now, but you didn't want to go there then. The law required that the legislature either vote affirmatively to continue to have the plant run or send a message to the board that we thought it was in the best interest of Vermont to have the plant run. In other words, the way Act 60 was written, the legislature had to make a judgment, yes or no. As you know, I felt very strongly the answer is no. We didn't have the option of simply saying, we can't decide. There's no vote in the legislature of, I can't decide. You have to vote yes or no. That's what Act 160 required. And as Senate, the pres as Senate President, I was heartened to get a 26 to 4 bipartisan vote stating that it's in Vermont's best interest to retire the plant on schedule in 2012. I still firmly believe that and I'll do everything I can to ensure that we retire it as soon as possible. Was there some deadline in Act 160 that said you have to, the legislature has to make a decision? Well, the deadline was March 2012 and I just want to refresh your memories. Until very few weeks before the vote, both Entergy Louisiana, Governor Douglas, and the department were urging us to vote. And in fact, when we hadn't voted the year that we adjourned prior to the vote that took place, uh, I was chastised publicly by the governor and others, Entergy Louisiana, for not having held a vote. They were begging us to vote. They didn't decide they didn't want to vote until they thought maybe the outcome wouldn't be what they wished. So it's really important to remember what happened here. I know Entergy Louisiana is good at convincing Vermonters of things that aren't true. It's important to remember what was true. Governor, what is the status with the uh, state-issued water permit for Vermont Yankee? Um, does a new one need to be issued? Um, 
And so what is the process of determining that? Again, that's a, that's a uh, judgment that we're trying to ferret out from Judge Martha's decision, and uh, I won't comment on that either. Governor, the death of Paul O'Toole in Burlington ignited this heated conversation about wet shelters. By lowering the eligibility requirements, are we now on track to opening wet shelters in Vermont? Is that what we're talking about here? What we're on track for doing, and I should probably let Commissioner Iacoboni say a word about this, what we're, on, what we're on track for doing is ensuring that every Vermonter has a place to go in our shelter community. And the shelters have been very cooperative with us in ensuring that we can make that happen. It's not easy for them, but there will be no Vermonters turned away in cold weather. Can we get a little bit more specific? Sure, I'll let the, the Commissioner take that. Thank you. What we've worked to do is to take our housing resources and go to our communities and say, how do you best want to spend these dollars to make sure that Vermonters and families are stable? That allows them permission, if it makes sense in their community, to go with a dry shelter or a wet shelter, to go with housing vouchers, a variety of different tactics. Some will work in some communities and some not in others. So to answer your question, the decision on wet shelters can best be made by the people in the local community if that fits and works for them. Governor Rob, <clears throat> there's a bill pending right now which would declare a three-year moratorium on uh, hydraulic uh, fracturing, also known as fracking, for natural gas in Vermont. Uh, I understand there actually is some shale in the Lake Champlain Islands that some people are eyeing as possible source of natural gas. Where do you stand on, these, on this issue? I support the bill. I don't think that we should be fracking for natural gas in Vermont. First of all, I suspect that the supply is not very, uh, I, I suspect that there isn't a lot of natural gas there, but secondly, I don't think that Vermonters want the chemicals pumped into the ground to extract natural gas here in the Green Mountain State. So would you prefer a ban? Uh, I'm gonna see what the legislature sends me. They're taking testimony. I have a lot of confidence in them coming up with the right answer. Governor, what can Vermonters anticipate in terms of property taxes when um, the Budget Adjustment Act doesn't guarantee that they won't go up? Well, Vermonters, let's remember that the great thing about the state of Vermont is that property taxes are decided locally on town meeting day when school budgets are adopted or not adopted. The legislature does not control property taxes. Local communities do. I support that system. Let's also remember that we have an opportunity here to ensure that property taxes do not go up as our school boards work cooperatively with local communities to, on average, level fund school budgets. And I've made very clear that Vermont is one of the highest spending per pupil states in the country, has an obligation to property taxpayers to, for the third year in a row, level fund school budgets. The good news is that for the first time in Vermont's history, as we watch our student count drop, as we have fewer and fewer kids to educate, we're finally finding that our teacher and staff numbers are dropping. So it should be easier for school boards to level fund budgets since we know that staff is a huge percentage of the cost. So property taxes are too high in Vermont. School boards have worked diligently to level fund budgets for the last two years. It's critically important that they do it again. So do you support the Olson Amendment that was passed unanimously in the House? You know, uh, first of all, I'll say that I don't think that the Budget Adjustment Bill should deal with 2013 budget items when the Budget Adjustment is making adjustments, mostly because of Irene for 2012. So that's a debate that should happen in a 2013 budget, and we'll have time to have that. I will be pushing to ensure that we have that debate at the proper place, which would be the 2013 budget. There is no one among us that doesn't want to reduce property taxes for Vermonters. But there are perils in that strategy that we should discuss, both around the state budget and our ability to take care of Vermonters that need us. We just heard Rita say that homelessness is rising in Vermont. There's more need there than we've been able to take care of. Just a few weeks ago, uh, legislators joined with me in a bipartisan spirit to spend $6 million to make up the gap between what the federal government provided for Vermonters to stay warm in their homes this winter and what we felt was necessary 
to keep Vermonters, elderly, seniors, disabled Vermonters, warm in their homes. So we have to make choices in budgets, and if there is any surplus money, I would suggest that we have those discussions. If we tie our hands too much, we won't be able to take care of those that need us. So do you agree that the $27.5 million gap in the amount of money that would be going toward the education fund um, isn't going to or is going to uh, increase local property taxes? It is really important, just as it is with Vermont Yankee, to remember how we got where we are. When I was president of the Senate, Everybody remembers challenges to change that was signed into law by Governor Douglas and passed by the Democratic legislature. Challenges to change required that school boards work together with their communities to come up almost immediately with $25 million worth of cuts to their budgets, and we booked that cut right there. We said the education fund will not be sending out $25 million because as we make hundreds of millions of dollars of cuts to the general fund, it's important that the education fund pay some small part of that by reducing cost. School boards from across the state came to us and said, we can't do it that quickly. We need more time. You didn't give us enough time between when the legislature adjourned in May and our being able to pass budgets, you were already in the budget years, to make those cuts. At the same time that that happened, I got elected governor. President Obama gave us one-time era funds of $19 million in Vermont to ensure that Vermont communities didn't lay off teachers and staff. Governor Douglas had proposed not sending that money out to local communities. I got together with school boards, the NEA and others, and we came to an agreement that we would send that $19 million out to communities to make up that challenge for change gap that had been signed into law by the, by the governor, but that in exchange, they would use the ensuing 14 months to cut an additional $23 million from budgets that challenge the change required them to do. That's the money we're talking about now. I believe, as I did then, and as the school boards and any and others told me they could do, that those cuts could and should and must be made so that property taxes don't go up. But there are some communities that are level funding or cutting, and they're still seeing three to four cent increase in the property taxes. All I can tell you is, on average, we need level funded budgets. People keep citing Burlington as going up. Well, Burlington is one of the few communities in Vermont where student count is going up. They have more kids to educate, and therefore costs are going up. That makes some sense. On average, it's important that the school boards deliver level funded budgets. I've seen some come in at zero. I just read one in Wyndham County that's coming in at negative 1%. They need to get to zero in order for property taxes not to go up. This is not a new conversation. This has been going on for several years in Vermont that suggests that suddenly this legislature or this governor is not sending money back and as a surprise is simply untrue. A question about um, public relations people. Um, you looking for a job still, Bill? No. Uh, <laughs> I've never seen the press be so sympathetic to <laughs> bad decisions well, for tax Well, this actually payments. goes to, uh, to the question of independence of the Green Mountain Care Board. But by, by speaking out so forcefully against their, the outreach firm that they were looking to hire, did you undermine their independence? Can we just go back to the record? Because you all are usually very good, and you were very bad on that story, all of you, collectively. And I'll tell you why. You missed the story. It was a Friday. I know you've gone home, but you missed the story. The story was Governor Shumlin, surprised, chagrined, to find that three public relations positions were being advertised in seven days and other places in his own administration. It wasn't about the Green Mountain Health Care Board. That's the story you all wanted to write. What I was extremely upset about, what I put an immediate stop to, was the things that I can control. My administration was advertising for three public relations positions after I'd made it adamant and clear to my cabinet and my secretaries, we don't hire public relations people to spend the press in the Shumlin administration. That was the story, team. Well, How you got off on the Green Mountain Health Care Board is a puzzle to me. Well, that's a separate story, right? So the Green Mountain Care Board was also had issued an RFP to hire their own. Right, and what, I said, about, and what I said about that was exactly what I would say if the Public Service Board, if the Supreme Court, or any other entity that I don't control 
decided to make to hire a public relations person. And how I feel about that is this. It's this simple. I don't believe that taxpayer money should be used by entities that I control as state government or that others control to spin the press for commissioners, secretaries, and others in power when we're perfectly capable of talking to the press ourselves. There's a difference between that and hiring someone to market Vermont, hiring someone to ensure that you have transparency in the health care uh, board deliberations, that you bring Vermonters in to help us build the smartest health care system in the country. That all makes sense. But the ads that I read that were advertised both for my administration uh, and for the health care board didn't appear to be getting at the second category that I'm outlining. But what about the perception that people had that you made a fuss about it and then they back off so they're not that independent? I never would have made a fuss if my own administration hadn't been advertising for three public relations positions that I do control. That's what I made a fuss about, and I will make a fuss about it if it ever happens again. So does that mean you contacted Anya Rader Wall? Absolutely her not. To, uh, I have no. I have had no conversations with Anya about this, her position. Again, the press missed the story. There were three public relations positions advertised for the Shumlin administration in the newspapers. I don't know, maybe you all sent your resumes in, and that's why you wouldn't write the story. Did you but know, that was the story team. Did you know that your chief of staff and secretary of civil and military affairs had spoken with Honorator Wall? Uh, about their position? About your position, the one that you're. Yeah, I'm sure they did. I mean, I, you know, but did I you know that they were. I mean, you said you in no way contacted on your Raider Wall, but did you have people? I, I made very clear that? to my administration that the ad that I ran, that, that was run, I thought was not a good judgment. But what I was really upset about was the three positions that I was advertising for that I didn't know about. Is that clear? But aren't those Am I not being clear be, here, Tim? Aren't, aren't those positions going to be filled anyway? We're just going to reword the ad? No, today? absolutely not. We're gonna, what we're going to do is, for any of those positions that were required to market Vermont, for example, uh, to New York and Boston, to bring tourists to Vermont and grow revenues, that position makes sense. But I will not approve secretaries and commissioners hiring public relations people to speak for them in an agency. I really believe that what makes Vermont's democracy so great is that you can have conversations like we're having with the governor, you can have them with Secretary Racine. You can have them with Commissioner Iacoboni and anyone in our state government. And that's what makes Vermont government work. It's a very fine line between the accessible, transparent, open government that we have and the slippery slope that the other 49 states tend to use where they have professional PR people spinning the press. I just don't think taxpayer dollars should be used for that. But is it, it sounded like the A&R position, for example. That she claimed that that's not what she meant. So well, is it going to be filled anyway? We'll look at them on a case-by-case -case basis, but if all I can tell you is I was reacting to the ads that I read in the paper. Do you think it's appropriate for the legislature to impose conditions through statute on uh, a potential CBPS GMP merger? What do you mean? For them to say uh, any, any merger needs to comply with uh, conditions as outlined in this piece of legislation that we're passing. Anyway. Whether that be that Melco has to be a benefit corporation, or, or maybe the legislature says we have to, we have ultimate approval over the merger. The merger has to be approved by the court of approval. I mean, obviously, the devil is in the details. That's why I'm asking what you mean. But uh, my general experience after years in the legislature is that there is no end to ill-conceived ideas that sometimes get written into bills that never pass. And I suspect you're outlining one of them. Quick thing on, on Yankee. You said that it's clear from the judge's order that Yankee will stay open past March 21st. And an appeal, if you file one, will take a long time by the AG's uh, admission. Any reason why a Vermont utility shouldn't sign some sort of short-term deal to buy Yankee Power after March uh, prices right? You know, I, I, I'm perfectly willing to talk about the past. I'm not willing to talk about the future until we've made a decision on how we're going forward. But I just want to remind you that it was not for a lack of effort that CBPS and Green Mountain Power were unable to negotiate a power purchase agreement with Energy Louisiana. Uh, 
they didn't want to sell us power then at a price that we can afford. And who knows what the future might bring. But I think it's really important to, to, to be reminded that when I go out and speak to Vermonters, which I spend a lot of time doing, I'm always struck by the gap between truth and reality on this question. Because Energy Louisiana has spent tens of thousands of dollars with ads up on television screens saying, if you don't run Vermont Yankee past 2012, businesses are going to fail and your rates are going to go way up. I've been surprised at how many Vermonters come up to me and say, huh, I've been reading in the press that, in fact, Vermont's not going to get any power from Vermont Yankee after our contract expires on March 21st, 2012. What's going on? Entergy Louisiana's been telling us that we got to keep them open or our rates are going to go up. I'm really surprised to find that's not true. And my only, my only response is, you know, that's consistent with our experience with Entergy Louisiana. They don't seem to always tell the truth. What about taxing Vermont Yankee, the waste or some other aspect, the, the water discharge? There's been talk about that. Is that all on hold? With the court case? You know, uh, I'm not going to comment on any uh, legislation that might affect the future of the plant until we've made a decision on the appeal. Why can't you talk about that until you make that decision? Just, I mean, is there, is there like legal reasons? What's the, what's the deal? Uh, yeah, there are legal reasons. I mean, you might notice that Entry Louisiana has been mighty quiet lately, and I intend to join them. Governor, where is the money coming from to support the plan that you announced today? Because we already know that millions of dollars in taxpayer money is going to support police who are managing homeless populations. So where is the money coming from? That's a good question. Uh, the money is coming from money that uh, has been allocated. Uh, when I included $1.5 million in last year's budget uh, to ensure that we had resources to help fight homelessness. And I can let Secretary Racine speak to the particular budget, if you wish. Thank you. Well, as the governor said, uh, approximately one and a half million dollars uh, was in fiscal 12 budget. We are, it's in the general assistance uh, budget, and we are trying to move it, as uh, was talked about earlier, from the more temporary type housing, for, like motels, uh, into uh, prevention and more permanent housing. Uh, some of the, there are 100 slots in there, for uh, Vermonters with uh, housing vouchers for Vermonters with mental illness. That is already part of the budget. It's part of the discussion around state hospital replacement, shifting dollars from the hospital to community-based uh, settings. So uh, there is, as best I know, no new money uh, anticipated in this. I'm looking at Dave just mm -hmm. for confirmation of that. Yes. Secretary McCain, do you think it will take some of the pressure off local police departments who are transporting people back and forth until they sober up and then bringing them to a possible wet shelter. It just sounds like there's a lot of time, money, energy put into that aspect. <laughs> no, I, I think that's that's probably right. I think there are people uh, who, uh, for lack of options, have been out on the streets and do come to the attention of law enforcement. And to the extent that we can, uh, particularly during these cold months, uh, give them an option of uh, places to go, it should take some of the pressure off local law enforcement. Where were the three people who died? Where did they die? Two in Burlington, one in Rutland. What is the population, homeless population, best estimate in the state? It's, 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 actually, it's, um, the, the annual count of homelessness is actually, it's actually happening today. So we will have more accurate numbers for you. Um, generally around 4,000 people in the course of a year um, stay at least one night in one of our state emergency shelters. And that's in some ways the most reliable number to work with because it's, um, the methodology is fairly standard. But on any given night, you have no idea? Uh, the, 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 the caveat I have to give here is we have people who are in homeless shelters, people who are in transitional programs, um, and so I can certainly get you some much more detailed information on that, but it's not going to fit neatly into a sound bite, unfortunately. So will that information that you collect be applied to this plan, or is this plan already in place as is? I think our, when we look at our counties and districts and where people are homeless, that can help inform what new programs are most needed. And, and just to sort of reiterate what has already been, been, been touched upon, um, 
we're not, I don't believe that it's the same fix exactly in every, in every community, but Burlington is, operates quite differently than one of our more rural communities in the Northeast Kingdom. The uh, Vermont Council on Homelessness, how long it, that was formed and then it's been disbanded or it's dissolved and now you're reconvening it? How, what's the background there? Good question. It was before my time. How did it get dissolved? Or not? Does anyone know that? Okay. Thank you. The, the, every state has an, it has an interagency council or a council on homeless, and so it is part of a, it ties into a federal initiative. <coughs> um, and they, as long as I've been around, so I, let, let's go with at least 10 years um, that there has been one, um, and we've, we've come to the point where we need to sort of recharge it um, to make sure that folks in the new administration Commissioner levels are uh, commissioner level staff are aware of it and are, are participating. And so, um, the Department of Housing and Urban Development is one of the groups that will ask us as a state for a plan, and this is the vehicle where we create that. Okay. So it's what does the executive order do? Does it actually reconvene it, or does it? I mean, why is that needed? The executive order creates the charge in terms of our role at both developing implementing and monitoring a 10-year plant and homelessness and it's it's a way we, there obviously is both federal and state funding involved in the fight against homelessness and it is it, it is a way that we can demonstrate to our federal partners and locally that we are as coordinated as we possibly can be i believe mean, ms martin might have Martin, the last i was on the last uh i was on the last one so i just wanted to say the intention in some ways is the same that it would be frontline shelter providers, housing developers, and state agencies working together so that we're not at cross purposes and that there's a better integration of resources and priorities. Because otherwise, in a state like Vermont, you can have everybody doing very disparate things and you don't leverage the resources of the policy as well as you can. What's wonderful about this initiative is there's a more aggressive push for this initiative with Angus linked to it as a coordinator, a housing director, is there's a more emphasis on creating new units of housing and breaking the fall. What can we do before someone becomes homeless to reduce the numbers? So, so does the order that you signed already lower the eligibility requirements, or is that to be decided? That's what That's to be decided, right? It's a, it's a separate process. The, the signing of the executive order, it was not connected to any modification of eligibility criteria. Does that make sense? But that's being announced as one of several steps to address homelessness today. That is one piece, just like announcing a, Angus's position. You worked hard to get that answer. <laughs> <laughs> Governor, um, a few senators this week said that they would make sure that the death dignity bill would not get out of committee this year. Um, is this the year to have this conversation? Well, you know, I, I believe it is. I mean, I think any year is the year to do the right thing for Vermonters. Uh, and it's certainly in the session, it's certainly in the process. Uh, I've heard many bills be called dead for the session that sometimes come to life. I think it's an important bill. I hope the legislature will pass it. Governor, what if um, the House delivers a bill for the Vermont State Hospital replacement that has more beds than we proposed. Well, you know, I'm... You accept that? Let's talk about the good news first. Uh, I'm really uh, appreciative of the hard work that the legislature is doing to try to get us out of the crisis that we're in. Uh, we all have to understand that we're right now in crisis management. We have our most vulnerable mental health citizens uh, who are not always getting the care that we wish we could provide because we're lurching from crisis to crisis. We lost our state hospital. We're doing very well under the circumstances. But as I said in the budget address, that could change any day. Tragedy could strike. We've got to move quickly. Uh, I've urged the legislature to use the budget adjustment to give us approval to move forward with the beds at Rutland and Broward. I think we've got to do that immediately. Uh, we could wait for the big bill or some other bill to approve the state hospital, but I really want to break ground on that hospital this spring. In terms of the numbers, I think we put together an integrated plan that's going to ensure, put patients first, that's going to ensure that we can provide better mental health services, cutting edge mental health services that are community based, only using acute beds when we need to. That 16 bed facility that we proposed for Central Vermont 
combined with the other acute care beds that we're going to have in the system, it's going to be a better system than we had before, probably the best in the country, and 16 beds is all we need from a clinical standpoint. So why build more beds than we need? Having said that, I have yet to find any new state hospital not built on the grounds of an existing hospital that has received federal reimbursement money from CMS. And I'm not going to be a governor that turns to Vermont's taxpayers and says, hey, we just built a new state hospital, and you have to pick up all of the cost of their care because the federal government won't pay theirs because we didn't comply with federal law. I'm just not willing to do that. So my view is this is an opportunity to build the best health care system for, me for mental health patients in the country. We've got it right. And to ensure that we get Vermont taxpayers off the hook of paying the bill where they've been for the last decade because of an inadequate hospital. So it's just common sense to me, Ann. So 16 beds. There's a reason for it. But we'll take your question. Go ahead. Well, I mean, I guess my understanding was uh, with the way Vermont's, I don't know, global uh, or the way global, Medicaid, commitment. global commitment is that Vermont could get federal money for a, a, a facility bigger than 16 beds in central Vermont. Uh, is that not true? Prove it. No one does. <laughs> and, and here lies the problem, Thatcher. Neither can anybody else. We don't know whether our global commitment is going to be reauthorized. We don't know whether CMS will really let us do that. So all I'm saying is, you know, there's plenty of legislators walking around, you know, with la la land plans. Mm -hmm. I'm not planning to join them. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to have the Vermont taxpayers be on the hook for our hospital costs after we build a new hospital. I'm not looking at the camera and saying, hey, folks, sorry we blew it. But isn't that. I mean, is that okay to have that be the limiting factor to, you know, what if, what if as I, beds As I than, made very clear, yeah. we have designed the best mental health delivery system in the country that delivers on the promise that we will have the best community-based care of any state in the country. Listen, mental health patients are no different than those suffer from cancer or kidney disease. They want to be treated close to home. They don't want to be taken off the central Vermont. What this plan does is give options for Vermonters to be treated close to home, even for acute care beds. That makes a huge amount of sense. So we're both right on the right track for the best quality care system and right track of protecting hardworking Vermont taxpayers to ensure that we get federal reimbursement for our state hospital for a change after a decade of Vermonters having to shell out all the cash. I think you're forgetting something. Wow. I might have and that is that FEMA money is available, I believe for the state hospital. And, and there's an opportunity here that we might not otherwise have. And I wondered if you could comment on that, please. You are correct that there's a chance that FEMA funds might be available to help us construct the bricks and mortar for the new facility. I would argue that over 20 years, my business person sense would tell you that the operating costs will be much higher than the bricks and mortar cost over a long period of time. We have to ensure that we get FEMA help to build and that we get federal help to operate. That is the smart, prudent, and fiscally responsible thing to do. As you know, I'm as cheap as any governor you're ever going to find. I think the Fed should be paying the same share to Vermont that they paid to the 49 states. 